good morning and thank you for joining me for the next to last lecture last time we uh, at the very end of the last lecture uh, we saw the the equations of motion of supersymmetry I, I thought i was going to do this later but i might as well give you also the supersymmetry transformations now of type two in the same formalism. By the way, this is called the democratic formalism. Uh, why democratic? Because you don't give preference to the forms of low degree, like zero to four over the ones of high degree. Six, eight, ten, but you admit them both. You give them both equal vote, so to speak. So there are uh, actually uh, I'll give only the supersymmetry transformations for the fermions for the reasons we already saw. First, we have the same term we saw for the uh, for the new short class of solutions. I gave you this already, but now we also have a contribution from the Ramon Ramon uh, form. like this this f <clears throat> the notation is still the same so the, here there would be slashes all over so this is f slash so you should associate to uh, every single guy here the corresponding by spino by uh, for example, F2 becomes F2 slash, which is F one half F mu nu, F mn, uh, gamma mn, and so on. The second, the second gravity note transformation is very similar. Hence my cut and paste. And here, I need to introduce a new friend. But no, have no fear. This is not particularly fancy. Lambda F is simply a sign. So you reverse the sign of F2, but not of F4, of F6. And of F10. And then to B, you reverse the sign of F3 and F7. So if you would like a more if you would like to have a more formal definition on a alpha on a form of degree k, lambda is defined as minus to the integer part of k over two. Perhaps I should write. Minus one to the. I spontaneously always say minus to the, to some power and not minus one. But I, I once in uh, college I got a low, lower mark because of this because the professor couldn't understand what I meant. And, uh, I still shocked. So 
to this day. So the, uh, the transformation, the D Latino is also uh, similar. I mean, it also has a, a term that we already saw. I should know this by heart, really. But the, well, you'll see why I don't know it by heart because I, I never used the Latino per se. So you see here, there's a peculiar combination. This gamma, F gamma. which gives you an idea that you could perhaps, that there's a um, combination where the Ramon-Ramon contribution goes away. And this is simply this operator acting on epsilon, epsilon one. There's a sign change where D is the Dirac operator. And well, I believe all the notation by now has been introduced. So, um, ah, there is a this. Uh, almost completely look the same in 2A and 2B, uh, but I made a couple of mistakes. Here, uh, you should put the plus minus. And also here. I remind you that in a, the upper sign, Is for two A, the lower sign is for two B. Well, I'm not reminding me, you know this because I maybe I never use this notation. But the thing I wanted to remind you of is that epsilon one has chirality plus, and epsilon two has chirality minus plus. So minus in two A and plus in two B. Um, okay, it can be a good exercise to check that the uh, that the objects have the chirality uh, that they are supposed to have. So, uh, so sorry, this was side two. So the dangers of cutting and pasting. Uh, maybe now I'm correct. Okay, so uh, sin one and sin two also are supposed to have the same, and also lambda one and lambda two are supposed to have the same chirality properties, and you should check that the uh, the the chirality works well. So for that, the, for example, that this term has the same chirality as this.
it's important to also um, notice that the Ramon Ramon terms change this um, index, this label of the of the supersymmetry parameters. They mix one with two. You see, the, in delta psi one f acting on epsilon two appears, and vice versa in both the Dilatino and the Gavitino. This will be important later. Okay, so this is a, a general, these are the general supersymmetry transformations. They don't look particularly nice, but uh, they, well, they could be worse and they, um, sometimes they look even worse when uh, people list them with all the separate degrees for some reason. Well, um, I guess you are forced to do so in 2B if you, um, if you want to use the non-democratic formalism, then the, your only option is to write it out degree by degree. Now, I don't want to check all this, but uh, so I'll give you, uh, in order to proceed, I'll give you, um, I want to review the, some easy, so the same simple solutions of uh, the equations of motion and super gravity and super and the supersymmetry transformations. In other words, some BPS solutions, which will uh, use as uh, partial inspiration for, um, for what we follow. So one, so these are the D brain and O plane solutions. Another motivation for introducing them is what I was saying last time that um, the O planes are necessary to overcome. Uh, well, first of all, to have Minkowski solutions. Perhaps we are not interested in Minkowski solutions, but they're even more uh, necessary to get uh, the Sitter solutions. I uh, will see very little about uh, the Sitter in this uh, uh, lecture uh, series because it's uh, a bit contentious, but uh, well, I'll say something towards the end. Uh, let's see. The solutions I want to present to represent the back reaction of a D brain or of an O plane in, uh, in plus phase. There was previous, uh, previous um, a pre-existing uh, just a flat vacuum and you put some brain on it and you uh, compute the back reaction. What's the metric, the results? Well, uh, you divide the directions in parallel ones and transversal ones. So these are one to p and these are transverse So from P plus one to nine. And that's it, that's the metric. H is a function, which I'll uh, give you in a second. But first I want to give the other fields also in terms of H.
and e to the phi is h to the three minus p over four. F is a bit more subtle because it has subtle that is is a a minus p form. Let's say the subtlety is that sometimes. So this is fine for high uh, P's. Uh, see, you have a choice between using the, um, the low P's and the high P's. Uh, in the democratic formalism, I should give you both, really. But I'll give you only the transverse part. In the parallel part can be used by these. So uh, This contains a bunch of uh, constants, and I'm sure you're too interested in what these uh, constants are. This V is the volume. of the eight minus P dimensional sphere. And this is the volume form of the, of the same. Example. For P equals six. Uh, of course, we know that V2 is 4 pi, thanks to Archimedes. And vol is 2. It's sine theta, d theta, d phi. Now, what is H? Of course, so you shouldn't attach. These constants are all very important, but you shouldn't. Um, in these lectures, we won't focus too much on them because they. We won't have time to um, check them very carefully. So H has a property that, uh, which is that the transverse flat Laplacian on H gives zero. So it's harmonic with respect to the flat metric, the pre-existing metric. And so for P, when P is um, less than seven, there are, well, for up to six, uh, there are three derivatives here. So for six, there, um, there are three transverse directions. Uh, 
So P equals six, it's a seven, uh, sorry, it's a six brain, which, is span, which spans seven directions, in, uh, including time. So there are three transverse ones. And uh, in that case, it goes like one over R. But already for P equals seven, uh, there are two transverse directions. So um, it doesn't go like a power anymore. So then we need to split the two cases. So for P less than seven, we put here one so that that large distance you recover plus space. And this constant is once again a mess. Uh, perhaps it's um, good to emphasize that the it's proportional to GS. And the volume of the transverse sphere again appears. Of course, this constant and this constant are related. Okay, uh, for P equals seven. Okay, so the, uh, this for um, for the P brain. For seven brain, it's a log with some undetermined um, um, constant or, or not. And for completeness, let me also give you for uh, what we have for D8. I hope nobody asks a question about the uh, D8 and D8 cases because it, um, then I could talk all day. For the OP planes, uh, things are slightly different because the charge, as you know, I think you know, the tau for uh, an OP tension is for the, this is the, for the experts in OP planes, this is the, the OP minus plane. And the minus comes about in that the, uh, the tension is negative. And so because of this, the gravity solution is slightly different for P less than seven, H has this uh, factor. Instead of having the N, so this is N, or NDP brains.
likewise for Pico 7. H has a different sign and it has a four. Now, um, these, as you can see, so here, if you uh, take a graph of these functions, uh, they stay positive here. They signal uh, uh, that something bad is happening. Uh, R equals zero. It's a singularity in general for now the nature of that singularity is, um, so actually it's not quite a singularity for P equal three, but uh, we'll uh, need mostly higher P's. Um, but here you see that there's a positive and a negative term and indeed for uh, small enough R, there's a, uh, you see that this H is even getting negative. This is even worse than the usual phenomenon for the for black holes because now this um, this H appears with a uh, square root, so the metric ceases to make sense in a, inside the region. There's a forbidden uh, region uh, of. Um, Radius related to this are not. The, so, but really, the, the curvature and the, in this case, for the OP plane, the curvature and the dilaton st uh, start getting large, um, even way outside this, uh, this forbidden hole. So that signals that this uh, uh, the supergravity is breaking down. You shouldn't take this uh, solution too seriously when you get too close to it, to the center. But so for completeness, I will give you this um, this formula. Okay. Now. I want to look for, uh, so now we go back to our problem of compatifications. We want to include these objects in our compatification, but uh, we don't want to study them just in flat space. And in particular, a fruitful uh, class uh, comes about by considering what happens with, uh, um, more specifically with, uh, with uh, D7. That's called the DF the theory class. So for D seven, only F one is different from zero. among the Ramon Ramon uh, fluxes. One way to proceed would be to uh, specialize these uh, supersymmetry transformations that we have seen. And you can take even H equals zero for, for this. I will later uh, tell you how you can uh, switch on more fluxes, but for now, uh, let's just look at this situation. So now, for example, well, perhaps we don't quite need this, but uh, just to be concrete, this is what you get. F1 
from the um, from the transformations that we saw previously. I guess a possible exercise, although not a very difficult one, is to check that they agree. The one over eight instead of one over sixteen is due to the fact that we in the sum both f1 and f9 contribute and you can check that the contribution that f9 slash uh, is in fact in this expression becomes equal to f1 slash you need to um, so f1 slash is a, a most, f9 slash is most specifically related to uh, the chiral gamma times f1 slash and then the chiral gamma can be sent away just uh, by using chirality of epsilon one. Okay, writing it like this is a bit silly, but I'll keep it for consistency. Yeah, so if you only have F1, it's uh, you can uh, compute to this uh, gamma M F1. Gamma M is, it just turns out to be equal to uh, minus eight F1 itself. Okay, I kept it like this. So now, we should learn how to take the spin or parameters. For this, we could um, there are two ways. So uh, neither of these I can explain in full detail, but let me tell you what um, it is the the logic. So in the previous compatifications, for example, for Calabria, we had here. Originally, we had this. And this. Uh, sorry, both of them are Carality plus now because they were in to be. We started with this for both a Calabia and the class with the H flux, but uh, then we for. For Calabria, we then decided to take the eta's to be equal in order not to look for two uh, spaces where with two uh, covalent constant spinos, but only one, which is simpler to find. In the uh, in the case with the with um, the Nershaw's class, we spotted an opportunity. We we found that it's uh, it was possible to have an equal one by setting it eta two to zero. Now, what about here? Here, crucially, we have this uh, um, the structure. The there is an equation that involves both epsilon one. Each equation, every equation, 
uh, involves both epsilon one and epsilon two. So if I plug this even prior to, well, not prior to classification, but uh, uh, even without knowing too much, if you, even prior to um, deciding whether you want to take M, a capital M equal to mu or M say, or let's say, look, 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 let's look at this. So we don't even have a derivative. You see that there will be a term with a zeta one. Let's say that this the phi is only internal, phi will only be as, as usual. So um, just like in first cases, uh, will be a function only of internal coordinates. So uh, the, this is really d slash phi, remember? So it's uh, dm phi gamma m, and so it contains only the internal gammas. And uh, so this guy would become of this form. And then there's this guy. So, well, I told you earlier that this can be, this is really minus eight F1 in this case. So there, since we only have one among our own flux, so this will become minus E to the phi. Once again, the, action on, so F1, I will take it to be only internal because uh, just like H earlier for the for compatification, I will take it only to be internal. But um, my point now is just that the, it will involve epsilon two. So in previous uh, cases, when we went from the uh, supersymmetry equations in uh, 10D to the ones uh, um, adapted to a vacuum, I always factorized the four dimension spinor and I ended up with the equations on the internal spinors only which I could then hope to make geometric in flavor, let's say. But um, now this factorization won't work because I have a zeta one and a zeta two here. How can I possibly take, take them away? So if I take, if I have a zeta one and zeta two independent, uh, then I should conclude separately that this is zero and that this is zero. And that doesn't look promising at all because it would, uh, remember we had a similar equation earlier. Um, we had DA acting on a spino and uh, equal to mu on a con conjugate. And we concluded in that case that uh, A was constant. And so here we are going to conclude also that phi is constant. Same thing for F1, we will conclude that F1 is zero. It will be a disaster. We'll go back to Calabiao. So how can we avoid this disaster? Well, we can avoid it by uh, saying that uh, the two are related. And one possibility is just to take them to be equal. Now, to be uh, honest, there is no, 
uh, nothing really says that they should be uh, immediately equal. They could be related in a uh, more sophisticated way. You could think, oh, I'll uh, uh, put a constant here. Or perhaps you could even think, oh, I'll put a gamma matrix. But I don't want to do that uh, in the context of vacua, which is the context I'm going to go uh, soon, because I've, after all, this is why I'm fact I have factorized the, the fermions, the spin-offs, uh, because that would uh, select one direction um, with respect to others. So because of uh, basically Lorentz invariance, if I want Minkowski or more generally invariants of the maximum supersymmetric space, I would like to uh, have a, lower, uh, a covariant constraint here. So I, I don't want to put a gamma matrix, but just a constant. But if I have a constant here, well, I can just uh, reabsorb it in, uh, um, in uh, the redefinition of uh, eta two. So really here, I can even take them to be equal. And at this point, you could uh, quite well follow with the, with the general analysis with theta one uh, different from theta two. So there are the presence of the, uh, so this is a general, in general, the presence of the Ramon, Ramon field always uh, requires us to, to take a constraint like this. But um, for the class I'm interested in now, I'll take a further ansatz, which is more specific to the class with F1 uh, equal to zero. So for the general Ramon Ramon. Class, I'll take this with theta one and theta two equal. But the, and the eta is not necessarily equal. That's the uh, most general thing I can do. But for the F theory class more specifically, I'll make an ansatz. This ansatz is that also the etas are um, proportional. Now, um, It's possible to to introduce here just an alpha. Uh, let's see how do I call it? Eta two. And then after I took this two to be equal, uh, this equation will. Uh, so th this zeta, now it's the uh, same zeta, so I can factorize it out. And the, this equation that I had above becomes And I remember F1 is only internal because of uh, maximal symmetry or space time, just like H last time. 
and here there would be, sorry, uh, an alpha. But um, when you consider the second equation here, you'll have a uh, very similar equation. Uh, sorry, the alpha would be here. And now it's easy to see. Sorry, the two ah, I made a mess. So let's call eta one plus just theta. So then that's the reason I had I didn't have the alpha before. Is that so you can either have no alpha and then uh, keep eta one and that two, two, or if you put the alpha, you uh, you only have one of the two. So uh, by comparing these two, you'll see that um, alpha square is minus one. And so alpha is plus minus i. This could also be uh, seen. Could also be seen by the supersymmetry of the D7. That is, I gave you the the formula for all the. Um, fields, but I didn't tell you what the supersymmetry parameters were. If you uh, do look for the supersymmetry parameters, you'll see that you end up with this. Since the uh, the uh, seven solution is a prominent example of a, a solution with F1, uh, then it makes sense to get inspired from it. But we saw that even if you start from just saying, by just saying, oh, the, they should be proportional, then you land on that uh, choice. So now selecting one of the signs, I, well, I don't want to analyze all the equations as we uh, did for the, for the you know, short class. But let me um, at least tell you some of the main features. If you also look at the other equations, so first of all, if you what what about these two? You see that they can be now um, collected as both of them. as d phi uh, plus i to d phi f1 and i will be explicit well maybe not on eta plus equals zero so because we know that the eta plus is annihilated by i uh, that by gamma a bar, I bar, uh, then this will uh, just imply that the phi um, minus I e to the F F1, one zero part is zero. And 
Denn von der Gravitino. With the external index, we'll get this. This mu is the parameter that appears in the killing spinor equation. And this now becomes minus uh, four. I to the phi f1 meta plus both of them reduce to this the same way as uh, this after these two after reducing uh, putting alpha equals i become the same and now this, uh, this is the same form as the one that we saw for the uh, Schwartz case alone. But now it doesn't imply, well, it, does, it still implies that uh, mu equals zero. But now, uh, so if you remember, at the time we, um, we concluded that the di bar, uh, the di bar a was zero. And then since A is real, we concluded that A was constant. But now the A comes with this uh, other friend. And the two together give this. It's really a similar equation. By the way, we, we see that these two are uh, similar. And in fact, they, uh, if, if you subtract them, you will find again, um, well, you'll see that uh, D of uh, 4A minus, uh, plus pi naught is again such that it's, uh, well, it's uh, uh, D I bar of this guy, of this combination is zero. So uh, once again, you conclude that uh, since that uh, combination is real, once again, you conclude that that's a constant. And so you can say this. And this happens stupid exercise, actually, exercise. Check this for the for the D seven solution or D seven. Um, well, here I'm looking for more general solutions, but so far <laughs> the things I found is uh, also realized in that case. Now for the next step, well, we write. F1 as D of something of a potential. It's not a particularly strange uh, step. We do the same for the F2 in uh, electromagnetism. But now this guy becomes the statement that the the uh, 0, 0,1 part uh, the one comma zero part of D of uh, C naught minus I. Uh, so it just, I can just multiply this by e to the minus phi, and then I 
by using this plug in this, I find that this is zero. Or in other words, that del bar tau is zero, where tau is C naught plus I e to the minus five. This is great because we, I have discovered that there is something holomorphic. So this holomorphy will be the key to success. I should now also analyze all the, uh, the external gravitino, but I'll, I'll just tell you what happens. Well, you see, it doesn't uh, quite give you that the uh, eta is covariantly constant, it just tells you that eta is, um, well, it, it's almost covariantly constant. And it turns out that uh, with uh, some tricks, you can almost uh, really almost make it to, uh, to be zero. Um, it implies, in particular, that the uh, space is scalar once you rescale it appropriately, namely you find that uh, You find this. And then, um, unfortunately, the, um, the one, so there is also something that is closed. Uh, so the, uh, you can also rescale so, um, omega so that it is closed. But it wouldn't be the. It wouldn't give you, it wouldn't uh, satisfy uh, the correct normalization. So what's the story? If you try to look for uh, the omega, which is also closed, let me write it like this. It looks stupid, but uh, you'll see what I mean. You'll find that it's this combination. Now, you face a choice. You would like to say that this now is a Calabiao. But unfortunately, uh, this, if you do this, um, you don't satisfy, remember that you have the J cubed is minus one over six. Um, so minus one over six J cubed is I over eight omega omega bar. So J tilde and omega hat here don't satisfy this, Sati but uh, satisfy a similar equation with a phi in front. On the other hand, the ones that do satisfy, if you uh, want to satisfy uh, this condition here, which you should because it's um, necessary for an SU2 structure, you should uh, define this guy. Now, J tilde and omega tilde do satisfy this. So this part tells you that uh, the you have dj tilde equals zero and d of omega tilde is not quite zero. And from this you recognize that it's uh,
a Keller manifold. Uh, this tells you that it's complex, and this one tells you that it's symplectic. Okay, this is a good result. However, and the other point of view, by using a J tilde and omega hat, is also nice because now uh, it is true that now the, the this this equation is no longer satisfied, but the uh, Yao's theorem has a more general. Uh, statement. We used it for Calabiao, but really what it said was that you could achieve any function you wanted here, not just one, by uh, the famous uh, uh, J tilde, uh, change in uh, J tilde. Yao's theorem said that for, uh, you can achieve any function you want here, by selecting lambda property. There exists a lambda such that you can achieve any function you want. For any, for any function here, e to the f, you can uh, find a lambda that uh, uh, satisfies such that a change in JT, then this way you can satisfy this equation. So if you rewrite the equation in terms of J tilde, the condition terms of J tilde and omega hat, which are closed, you don't satisfy the original equation uh, that you needed for an SCT structure, which is, uh, so it's not a Calabiao in particular, but Yao's theorem tells you that uh, there is a solution. So this is a Kähler, uh, to be clear. So the, uh, we concluded earlier that it's a Kähler uh, manifold, but the, it wouldn't be enough to claim that you have a solution without Yao's theorem because you need to achieve, uh, to, to have this, uh, a clear manifold here would have a random W, whereas you want W uh, to be exactly this minus D phi over two. Long story short, Yao's theorem implies solution exists. So M6 is scalar. Like I said, there's not any scalar. Um, if you, uh, if you um, make this logic uh, even further, if you follow this logic even further, you find, you'll find that the, uh, the C1 uh, should be positive by which I basically mean that the integrals uh, over any uh, two cycle are positive. So it should be a final. I'm not quite ready to abandon this class. We have found a lot, <laughs> but we still haven't uh, seen a single solution. So how do you uh, find solutions? You should have this holomorphic tau and the, this uh, on this final manifold. And you might say, okay, I'm done. I'll just write uh, any holomorphic function on a compact final and I'm done. Problem. on a compact manifold. There are no holomorphic functions. So not good. On the other hand, uh, nobody really said that the uh, tau should be a function. Why? This is thanks to a symmetry of type two B. Uh, 
this is a cell to R in supergravity, but it's believed to become a cell to Z in uh, full string theory. Given a matrix uh, M A B C D in uh, S L to Z. Tau is sent to A tau plus B over C tau plus D. These are called maybe transformations. F five is left invariant. Um, And the two three forms that we have in the theory. Into A we have uh, into B we don't. Into A we don't have two three forms, uh, but into B we do, because the Ramon Ramon contains a three form. Ramon Ramon form contains a three form. Uh, and finally the metric. Um, I'll give it in terms of the metric that we used uh, for the for the action, one comment. Uh, this is the, so the one I've been using is the so-called string frame action, a uh, string frame uh, metric. There is also so-called Einstein frame metric, which is, uh, um, Rescaled by a power of the dilaton by into the phi over four, um, into a phi over two for the metric, and the uh, that one uh, doesn't rescale. That one doesn't transform at all. This one also implies uh, if you define C G three. Uh, to be, you can define it in two ways. You can, uh, well, let's define it that this. Then G3 transforms like this. An exercise. It's a nice one. Okay, so in particular, tau is not invariant. So, the, sorry, tau, let me restate it tau is um, equivalent to many other taus. Any value of tau is physically equivalent to many others. In the space of all taus, you probably have seen this. For example, if you take um, M to be like this, then this corresponds to tau going to tau plus one. And so the fundamental region for this identification can be a, a strip. For example, you can take a strip of uh, width minus one half. But you can also take M 
to be like this, in which case tau is identified with minus one over tau and the fundamental region for this, well, this uh, inverts the radius, inverts the modulus. So it sends um, vectors of uh, large uh, modules with uh, one small modules, and you can take the, the addition in the fundamental region is taken to be this uh, region here. It's a fundamental region for both identifications, and these two generate SL to Z. So you don't need to find really functions tau, holomorphic functions tau. You can avoid that by uh, taking functions that are only invariant up to up to uh, some identifications. Now here uh, starts the the mathematical sophistication. You can get inspired for from example for the this uh, by the D seven. Remember that the uh, C, the F1, well, H had a log. And if you put all together, N D7. Becomes something like this. So it's a log. And already in, in this case, you see that, uh, well, this, this is not a compound. Uh, this would be with the transverse space, which is just an R2. And I guess if you wanted to see this as a vacuum solution, you could do so by uh, dividing the eight parallel directions into four Minkowski and uh, four internal ones. And the internal space would be would um, have four parallel directions and two transverse ones. But this wouldn't be compact. This would be non-compact, but already for this, you see that tau is not quite a function because it has a uh, branch cut uh, because of the log. And if you go around the branch cut, tau uh, in the z-plane, If you go around the branch cut, tau uh, goes into, doesn't get back to itself, but it becomes tau plus one. But then you can also apply our SL to Z transformation. To obtain uh, new solutions where tau doesn't uh, transform with this uh, matrix, but with a conjugate matrix. So a matrix that is similar to So this, by the way, is called monodromy. And by an SL to Z transformation, say C, um, you can find a solution with monodromy equal to uh, C times this and C minus one. It turns out that these can always be parameterized in terms of two integers. 
uh, to be uh, precise, sorry, this n d seventh. So uh, it's the this operation repeated n times. So it would be tau that goes into tau plus n, which is this matrix to the nth power. So in general, such a solution is called, uh, since it can be parameterized with two integers, such a solution would be uh, called the PQ brain, PQ7 brain. One doesn't want to call it the PQ D7 because, no, well, it doesn't have a fundamental definition. Now the dilaton in general will be uh, large everywhere in the solution. Uh, but by analogy with the D7, it's called the D7 brain. Well, okay, so now uh, it would be a bit lengthy to show you the techniques that can be um, used so that uh, we overcome this obstacle of the fact that there are no holomorphy functions by using the fact that there are, um, that uh, tau can have monodromies. I'll just tell you that compact solutions can now be found. the J function, which is a function of tau, which is invariant under SL to Z. In other words, it has any, so under tau that goes into tau plus one, it remains invariant. It has this property. Uh, this m dot tau. Is this a definition? So, uh, since this is invariant, it, uh, you can find automatically uh, solutions where tau has the correct monodromy by dictating what the uh, J function should be. My last remark, uh, then I, I talk about uh, F theory. I cannot uh, not say this, is that the solutions can be is a geometrical in even more geometrical intuition can be obtained by noticing that tau uh, has the same properties of uh, the modular parameter of a torus. So if you define for a torus, so if you define a torus by uh, saying that Z in the Z plane, that Z is equivalent to Z plus one, equivalent to Z plus tau, then you realize that if you, uh, the torus with tau plus one defined by tau and the torus defined by tau plus one are the same. And also the torus defined by tau and the, uh, defined by minus one over tau are also the same. And so you can formally identify, formally understand this tau uh, with the, as the um, modular parameter of a torus.
So then for every point on M6, there will be a torus. And the seven brains are in this. Um, so if you just uh, follow the geometry, if you follow this identification, you'll find that the uh, seven brains will consider to uh, this torus sucks. Here's a more canonical torus. Um, will be associated to points where the torus degenerates. Typically, generically to a, uh, to a, um, a sphere with two points identified. There are more general uh, uh, configurations that can be obtained, which are non-generic, which you can obtain by making uh, several seven brains coalesce, and then you find uh, uh, worse uh, degenerations. For example, you, you could have a degeneration to not to a, a sphere with two points identified by by some uh, kind of sausage or necklace. So you could have something like this also. But I'll stop here with F theory. Enough F theory. It's an important class, but we want more. So one thing we'll see is that we can add more flux to the um, uh, to this F theory class, and this will become important. The uh, internal. Um, the internal metric will be further distorted, but not incredibly by much. We'll find this, however, as a particular case of uh, uh, our general discussion tomorrow. But one thing I, I notice now is that so far, I have only been able to discuss um, Minkowski solutions, and we don't live in Minkowski. So we would like to learn how to obtain solutions with the cosmological constant. I'll start with the remainder of the today's lecture by um, considering, by giving you a primer about some simple ADS solutions. And then uh, tomorrow we'll uh, set up the, um, we'll uh, see what the general answer is. I'll give you the general formalism finally, and uh, we'll see what can be said more generally. The simplest solutions I think you have already seen. I know that you have already seen in a uh, in, uh, uh, course uh, about holography. It doesn't have the correct dimension that we would expect for space time, but for that matter, we also don't uh, know that uh, lambda is not um, <laughs> negative. So uh, let's just uh, pursue it for uh, its own sake and we'll, we'll see. How, how you can help us. I think you, um, if I understand correctly, you also saw how it arises as a near horizon limit. Uh, but it's uh, nice to see how that um, comes about since now we know the general structure of the solution. So the, 
we had some radius here. Never mind. I mean, I'll call it uh, L. And then the structure was that we had the H to the minus one half. Here we had the uh, parallel directions. I'll now call it the Minkowski four. Sorry, this is uh, the three solution. And here we had the transverse uh, directions. But in uh, radial coordinates, this can be written like this. And If you go in a region where R is much smaller than L, you can, so then this uh, first, uh, this term here dominates. The, this becomes a one over R2, which cancels out to this R squared to give, to give you an R, um, And S five. And on the other hand, the R squared plus oh, um, the R squared over R squared plus R squared. So this is R to the minus four, but the uh, um, elevated to the minus one over two becomes R squared. This is radius five. So We get the famous result. Um, it's possible to see that the, the same phenomenon already happens for extremal um, charged black hole in a general relativity in four dimensions. In that case, you get the ADS2 times S2, which is so-called uh, so called Bertotti Robinson uh, solution. Uh, and the, in that case, you don't have this, but you would have a, a function one plus M over R uh, to the power minus two. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's a good exercise. For the flux, well, I gave you earlier only the, um, well, I check up a second, give you what that is just for completeness. And here you just get, so we, we have, what I wrote um, in the general discussion was the, the part with the volume form of the transverse space, but by duality, since uh, F5 should be self-dual, you also have 
here the volume form of the parallel part. This n um, can also be seen because there, uh, the, uh, there's a plus quantization in, um, in string theory, similar to the uh, Dirac quantization for Uh, for the um, Dirac monopole, say. And so, okay, maybe that discussion is a bit long, but uh, uh, that would fix your descent uh, uniquely. So, the, the, we would have uh, in supergravity, we would have here continuous parameter, but then um, turns out that it's um, discretized by uh, this flux quantization. Good. Uh, there are more general, so there are generalizations of this phenomena, of this phenomenon. Already here, well, first of all, there's a similar phenomenon in M theory. Uh, I haven't given you the, uh, the um, equations for motion, the supersymmetric equations, nor the uh, solutions for the N2 and the N5. So I, I don't want to give you uh, to cram everything in here now, but I can tell you that for the same phenomenon also happens for an M2, which produces ADS4 times a seven, and then M5, which produces ADS7, Answers for. For all other brains in flat space, this trick of the near horizon limit doesn't work, meaning it does not produce an ADS solution. So you might have imagined by guessing from the D3 case that uh, you might have got an idea plus, uh, P plus one, P plus two. But this is not what happens. Exercise, check it, see what happens. Well, uh, it's kind of obvious it, the, here there's a small miracle that was happening for, for us to reconstruct this and it, it doesn't happen again. In M theory does. The holographic interpretation is that the theory, uh, whereas the theory living on a D3, as you know, is uh, n equal four super mills and uh, um, LS going to zero limit. Um, and that's uh, for dimension you means uh, n equal four super is is uh, conformal invariant. The maximized supersymmetric uh, super means in uh, any other dimension than uh, four is not conformal invariant. Uh, whereas the theories living on the N2s and N5s are uh, conformal invariant. Or so at least one believes for the M2, this uh, long held belief was uh, finally um, proven right by the advent of uh, the ABGM solution, uh, the ABGM field theory. But for the M5, we still don't know what the, at least we don't know uh, Lagrangian realization for this, um, for this M5 theory, which is believed to be conformal because of this. But let's see whether we can, uh, how we can uh, draw inspiration from these cases to uh, get more general solutions. The simplest trick that you can consider is to put that, um, so, so far we put, uh, for example, for the D3s, we put them at the, uh, in flat space and then we took the near horizon limit. 
But why should we take them just in flat space? We can also put them on a pre-existing, another Ricci flat space, pre-existing Ricci flat space. The computation shouldn't change much. Because after all, the, in the equations of motion, uh, all that matters uh, is the, so only the Ricci, the, so for the supergravity equations of motion, only the Ricci tensor of your space time um, works. So intuitively, uh, it shouldn't be hard to believe that if you put, if you repeat the same exercise with any other Ricci flat manifold, other than just a flat space, you still get um, the same phenomenon with an ADS solution. However, if you put them on a smooth Ricci flat space and you then uh, do a near horizon limit, what you're doing is you're going very close the uh, D tree brain. So if you go very close to every uh, smooth space, by definition, uh, will look like RN, a manifold is that. But that's perhaps you might say that's just a differentiable structure. What about the metric? Yeah, but any metric also uh, becomes, um, there's a the coordinate system where it looks like uh, the eta metric plus some corrections, uh, Riemann normal coordinates. So anyway, when you, uh, when you get very close to, any, uh, to a point, uh, to a smooth point, any manifold will uh, become even metrically uh, the same as the as flat space. So that's not really a generalization. However, we can consider singularities. What about those? What does that mean, first of all? Well, let me draw something. It means that uh, the space is richly flat away. But then there's some delta like Ricci here. For uh, when I go very close to this point now, so the, if I had a general behavior here, when I go very close to this point, I would expect this to be no longer flat because it's. Um, no longer just a flat space because it's a singularity, but at least I would expect it to look conical to, uh, to acquire uh, some new rescaling symmetry. Or at least I want to, um, that's when uh, things will become interesting because here, suppose that instead of, so the, these transverse coordinates are now no longer like this flat space, but they are the form dr squared plus r squared and other five manifolds in five. Then, well, the computer, nothing changes in this computation except the fact that they have replaced this five with a, a different manifold. So the now the near horizon limit gives this. Okay, but now I should look for, I should find such um, more general, um, such five manifolds so that the cone, so this is called the cone, by the way, conical manifold or cone C over M5. because of the drawing really. <laughs> the cone over S5 is just flat space. So 
So I should look for uh, conica Ricci flat manifolds. What's the uh, nicest? Uh, so how, do I know already Ricci flat manifolds? Yes, we know Calabiao uh, Ricci flat, uh, the Calabiao manifolds, which are Ricci flat. So uh, for example, I could look for uh, conical. Calabiaus. Problem. Yao's theorem, which we used to find Calabiaus is only valid in the compact case. So we cannot quite use it to, to find uh, such manifolds. Luckily enough, uh, there have been a, uh, other techniques developed over the years, uh, relatively recent techniques. So uh, one possibility is the so-called toric techniques. I, I wish I had the time to explain uh, toric uh, geometry, that would, that would take at least one lecture. But once if, um, so, One and six. Torque. There are simple criteria uh, that guarantee that it is a Calabiao. And just to give an idea, these are don't dead back to the Ordovician, but to the to this century. Uh, toric means that the isometry group of, uh, of the metric contains a U1 to the uh, three in our case. There are many famous uh, uh, cases. Uh, one is called the Cornifold. Where now M5, the quote unquote base of the cone, but yeah, this is called the base of the cone. Is 
is a closet. Uh, incidentally, there are other, so you can uh, try with the, with other um, uh, quotients, but uh, there isn't much in uh, five dimensions. However, there, there are more in uh, higher dimensions. More recently, there is a technique called case stability. Uh, which has been applied to this particular problem. For example, uh, in this paper in 2015. <laughs> So the techniques are really um, quite fresh, let's say. And then there are explicit solutions, which are a bit older. So someone was asking me whether uh, beyond the Minkowski case, beyond the Calabiao case, we uh, use existence theorems or rather explicit cases. This um, case of uh, where we have a conical Calabiao is one where we still have some existence theorem. Otherwise, uh, in most cases we rely on explicit. matrix. The trick is that you um, you impose a large, relatively large symmetric group on your space. And uh, for example, a closet is um, it's a very large uh, symmetric group and the, the orbits of the symmetric group are the, the whole M5. What, does, what is the orbit of a, a symmetric group? Well, of the isometric group. It is uh, the set of all points that can be reached by starting from one and applying all the possible isometries. So it, if you have that, then your problem is completely reformulated in terms of algebraic equations, and that's uh, easy to solve. If you do something more modest, if the, so you can more modestly say, oh, I'll, um, I want the, the orbits to be at least four dimensional. And then you, did, uh, you completely solve the, easily solve the problem in all those four directions, but you have one direction left. And then you should, uh, so you're reduced to solving um, a system of uh, ordinary differential equations. That's not always easy, but uh, some smart people can do it. For example, This and this is uh, slightly older, still in this century. Well, okay, the list could go on, but these are the main uh, ideas. By the way, I didn't say that uh, by definition, when uh, the cone over M5 is a Calabiao, M5 is called. Uh, Sasaki Einstein. We have only a few minutes. 
I like to say just a couple more things about the Sazek Einstein's and then we move on. Tomorrow I'll tell you uh, uh, something about more general solutions. I don't give it, uh, I also don't want to give the impression that all uh, ADS solutions are of this form and they have a uh, Sazek Einstein in thermal space. Uh, this a bit like the ADS analog of the Calabiao um, case. It's just the, the simplest one you can explore. In particular, there wouldn't be any ADS4 uh, if that were the case uh, so far. But here, DM2 gives ADS4 times S7. So you can, uh, more generally, you can obtain. with the same idea. Idea is four times an M7, which is as Isaac Einstein in, in seven dimensions. And the techniques are still more or less the same. Now you should, uh, toric means you want to the fourth and there are many examples and case stability applies to those as well. I should say this hasn't been explored much in the physics literature because I guess people have moved on to better things. What about ADS7? This can also be uh, generalized, but not much. It turns out that uh, you can only achieve S4 mod gamma this way. I'll tell you tomorrow, perhaps a uh, little bit about the fact that uh, you can achieve. Um, so if you go to 2A, there are more general ideas, seven solutions. Uh, finally, I want to conclude with the um, couple equations about the, I want to give a, a less poetic uh, reformulation of what um, Sazak Einstein is. Let's uh, focus on dimension five, but uh, very similar things are true for dimension um, seven. This will take five minutes. So given that there is a radial, um, so the, the thing is conical, you have uh, that this RDR is a killing vector. Well, not quite a killing vector, the, but the, the metric is charged to under this. It's a conformal killing vector. And the, uh, since you have a complex structure, this is a Calabiao, uh, you have a complex structure and you can apply it to, to this vector. And this gives you a vector along um, five now. called the re vector. Dually, by using the metric, you can also define, so this is a vector, it has a one index up, but uh, you can also lower the index. I usually call, a vector and the corresponding form with the same letter, but in this case, it's traditional to do otherwise. And now, uh, you can try to uh, um, decompose your J and omega defining the Calabiao structure using the fact that you have these special directions. You have uh, the R direction and you have this uh, side direction or it's dual uh, one form eta. 
it turns out now not motivating this fully that you uh well you say well, let me try to maintain it like this so the complex structure uh, pairs up the r direction with this psi or the dr with this uh, uh eta so you can imagine that there's a complex field bind so holomorphic field bind of the form uh, you have dr plus i r times eta so eta and r are related and then there are the holomorphic field binary of the some other uh, which are along purely along m5 and then with an r just because the metric says this r squared and now using this fact you can show that j and omega decompose this way where little j and little omega are forms on m5 and they define an SU2 structure now. They, they have a similar definition as the one for an SC3 structure. And uh, you can exercise by applying the fact that J and Omega are closed, you find Uh, these equations. So these are an alternative characterization of Sasaki Einstein. In other words, you can just uh, look for Zadak Einstein by solving these equations. These are uh, nice because they're, well, they're reminiscent. For example, this one uh, reminds us again of the uh, properties on uh, um, the define, of the property that defines a complex uh, manifold. But uh, now we, it's on a odd dimension manifold. It's a different uh, story. Okay, so um, only one lecture remains. And uh, next time, after all these uh, special classes, next time I'll attack finally the, the general uh, problem. Uh, of course, I've, there are many things will be cut out, but this is the, so I've tried to give in this uh, lecture, set of lecture notes more focus on the, on the things that are already known <laughs> rather than to those that I don't know. Let's see if this time, incredibly things still work so I can stop the recording. <laughs>